Welcome aboard. Jill Holbrook here, the cloud tech guy. I wanted to reach out and let you know here is session five of my mini boot camp session. I've got five more to go. This one here is specifically on Hyperledger Fabric. Let's go ahead and talk about how F Hyperledger Fabric fits into the Certified Blockchain Solutions Architect examination. Now, when it comes to blockchains, Hyperledger Fabric is one of the blockchains you really need to know for this exam. Now, in case you're not aware, Hyperledger is what? It's an open source collaborative effort by essentially the Linux Foundation and the companies that are working together as a consortium. It's a community effort, essentially. It's software developers that basically work together to accomplish an open source solution. So we're going to talk more about what it is. Uh, we're going to talk about consensus. We're going to also compare Hyperledger Fabric to other blockchains. I have some review questions, and then we'll talk about more resources you can study. Now, Hyperledger is an open source project. Uh, it's, it's focused on building blockchains. It's managed or hosted, I should say, by the Linux Foundation. It's global open source collaboration, essentially, is what it comes down to. Now, basically, it uses what's called an umbrella strategy. Uh, the Linux uh, project really looks at it uh, from uh, the Linux Foundation, I should say, looks at Hyperledger, you know, and all the solutions and blockchains that are under Hyperledger as an umbrella strategy. Now, basically, the goal is to help incubate uh, blockchain technologies, frameworks, applications, etc. <clears throat> so it's hosted by the Linux Foundation. Make sure you know that. Uh, you may want to remember that. It is open source as well. And again, it's a modular approach. So let's talk about the project itself. What exactly does the project consist of? You have the infrastructure, that's the ecosystems that accelerate development. You have frameworks. These are the different approaches to different blockchain frameworks. For example, you have a Fabric, Aurora, Composer. Uh, for example, and then you have tools as well, right? And again, there's many different tools that uh, is, is under that project umbrella. So let's discuss consensus in this module mainly. Now, consensus is what? Consensus is basically how does all the nodes that are on the blockchain, whether you have two or 200, sort of come to agreement that this transaction should occur? But basically, when we talk about consensus, it has to satisfy two properties. The first is safety. It means that each node is guaranteed the same sequence of inputs and results as the output on each node. Basically, for that transaction to be valid, it has to match up to, to what was sent, and you know it has to have the correct sequence. And again, in other modules, I'll, I'll cover, if you take the full course, uh, you'll certainly get hashing and you'll understand how uh, these transactions are actually processed. But for this module, we won't go too deep into some of this, but just be aware. The second item is liveliness. In other words, making sure that each non-faulty node will receive that transaction that's been you know, submitted. In other words, you know, that node has to be available to receive it. Now, when it comes to consensus, Hyperledger uh, uses what's called a permissioned-based uh, voting consensus mechanism. So it's permissioned voting-based consensus. And basically, um, this is uh, also coined as what's called the lottery-based consensus. Basically, the goal is that it's voting-based. The algorithm uh, is going to take, of course, the most efficient approach to provide that transaction, to close on that transaction, that's the goal. Now, if you have more nodes, uh, it's going to typically take more time to reach consensus. That's one of the trade-offs. Another trade-off, uh, you know, to look at it is scalability and performance. Uh, 
the greater you scale out, the lower the performance. You have less nodes, probably the better you know performance, right? Like if you compare it to like Ethereum, right? The more nodes on Ethereum, what happens? That transaction just takes longer and longer because that blockchain is going to be updated among the nodes, right? When it comes to consensus, it's planned out in three phases. The first is endorsement. The second is ordering. And the third is validation. Now, Hyperledger um, uses an interesting approach where a lot of blockchains, what they typically do, will go ahead and order before they endorse it. But Fabric approaches it a little differently. Endorsement is really driven by the policy. Basically, it's based on the number of signatures and basically what participants endorse a transaction. You have what's called an ordering phase. Now, this uh, ordering phase basically is what gets the endorsed transaction and agrees to the order to be committed on the ledger. So remember, that's endorsed before it's actually committed to the ledger. And then what happens is we have what's called validation. Basically, it takes that block of order transactions and then validates the correctness of that result. Now, let's talk about some features of Hyperledger. Now, Hyperledger Fabric is a modular design. Basically, you have components that are plug and play in, in, in a high level. It's not totally plug and play, but you want to look at it from that perspective. Let's go ahead and talk about the main modules. The first is membership services. Now, this module is a permissioned module, module or the permissioning module. And it acts as a vehicle to establish a root of trust during that network tra transaction. But also it's instrumental in ensuring and managing the identity of the members of the Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. And so when we look at membership services, it uses what's called a membership service provider known as an MSP. Basically, this is a... a it's an abstract sort of component, essentially, of the service. And the goal is to provide credentials, essentially, uh, and help establish that root of trust. There's authorization services that are part of uh, the MSP, for example. Uh, again, you don't need to know those details for the test, but you do want to know the, the modules. Then you have transactions. Now, a transaction is what? That's a request to the blockchain to execute a function on the ledger. And how does this, this function actually get executed? Well, it's actually implement, implemented through what's called chain code. Basically, chain code is what? It's a smart contract, computer code, right? And again, um, the goal is to execute that transaction as efficiently as possible. Now, when it comes to smart contracts and chain code services, Essentially, it's an application-level code that's stored on the ledger as part of a transaction. Now, one of the things to know for the exam is that the chain code does run the transactions, but again, um, it could also modify the world state. Now, when it comes to a chain code, a couple things to think about here. Now, chain code, as you're likely aware, is basically when you're writing it, you want to, of course, be aware that it's going to be written in what programming language? It's going to be written in Go. And you'll, of course, want to set it up, configure it. You'll need to, of course, make a directory for your chain code application. Uh, you, you'll also have to create child directories, uh, for example. Now, one of the, the things to pay attention to is that the chain code, when you implement it, right, it's going to invoke basically one of two functions. One is going to be the init function, right, or the invoke function. Another thing to think about there. Now, when it comes to the code services, remember that the chain code is installed on the peers. So where is chain code installed? It's on the peers. And those peers have to require access to the assets that they have to go ahead and perform those read and writes on. Now, there's also transaction logic that's written as chain code. Typically, it's in Go. However, it's possible to write in JS as well. But the goal is to execute in a secure Docker container. Uh, 
So as far as the fabric design, it's, it's designed in, an, in a containerized approach where it's basically utilizing the Go programming language. And the logic uh, that you're going to you know, configure, basically, how does this smart contract execute? How does this chain code execute? Basically, if so-and-so does this, if this event happens, go ahead and complete uh, the smart contract or the chain code, right? Go ahead and execute that transaction. And again, when you're calling these specific functions in the chain code, uh, you know, you want to make sure, of course, that it checks for validity. It looks for all the proper arguments. That's more development focused. Um, for developers that really want to get certified in, in Hyperledger, uh, BTA has a Hyperledger Fabric uh, developer certification. Uh, it's a very challenging cert. I encourage you to take a look at it as well. But let's go ahead and talk about the CBSA more. Okay, what about the features? When it comes to blockchain features, Hyperledger, uh, of course, fits into specific areas really well. The first is from an industry perspective. It's a cross industry. It's not really regulated to just financials. In other words, a use case can be far and wide. There's customers out there, uh, study case studies that have already been published by IBM and numerous other companies uh, that are posted on the Linux Foundation uh, website as well from logistics to pharmaceuticals to government, so on and so on. Governance is the Linux foundation. The ledger type is permissioned. Now, remember in a previous module, we talked about permissioned and permissionless. Consensus is pluggable. Now, with Hyperledger, though, again, it's a pluggable framework. You have some flexibility in what you want to do. However, um, you know, from a, uh, a chain code perspective, or actually in a chain code perspective, but from a consensus perspective, I should say, uh, you know, using a BFT approach is probably going to be um, what would be recommended in a lot of cases. Now, when it comes to smart contracts, it supports smart contracts. Uh, there is no native cryptocurrency like, unlike with Ethereum, there's tokens. Uh, and again, the enterprise blockchains typically aren't going to want, need a cryptocurrency or a token. Uh, XRP is the exception that is more um, based on uh, a different approach. Um, it's a centralized blockchain, uh, if anything. But uh, we'll talk uh, for this exam. Uh, just to be honest, you need to focus on Ethereum and Hyperledger for these this exam here. So as far as Hyperledger is concerned, you know the main thing is to know is permission, this pluggable framework. There's no cryptocurrency supports smart contracts. Let's go ahead and go through some review questions. When it comes to voting-based algorithms, these are advantages for different reasons. What's the main reason they're going to, to have an advantage? The main reason is because of the low latency finality. Uh, again, you know, if you have a voting-based approach, you're not really uh, using proof of work. You're not going to go and have um, a lot of competition. You don't, you're not really... Uh, having a you know 10,000 nodes is not a permissionless blockchain. Uh, generally, it's very low latency. That's really uh, one thing to think about uh, as well. Hyperledger Fabric consensus is planned out into three phases. Which one is not a phase? Well, remember we had endorsement, ordering, and validation. And the one that is not correct is segregation. What about transaction logic? Now remember that it's written as chain code and what happens, it's executed in a Docker container. What languages are supported? Essentially it's JavaScript and Go. Those are the two supported languages. Now Node.js, PHP, Python, again, not supported for chain code. However, that doesn't mean you can't develop a front end using those. But just pay attention to, to what is supported, where in the blockchain ecosystem you're at. Now, there's some practice questions on Udemy. The link is there. The discount code is uh, right there as well. I encourage you to take it if you need some help with practicing for the exam. There's also some other courses. I've got uh, events that are being held. I also have a, a Hyperledger Fabric course as well on Pearson Safari.
I encourage you to join. Uh, Safari is really good in a lot of cases because you get to join not only video lessons, but live online courses all for a low monthly fee of, I think, $40 or $50. It's not too expensive. Uh, very affordable. And uh, the training, um, again, from other instructors as well as myself, is really uh, top-notch. And for the cost, it's pretty hard to argue that it's not a bargain. Okay. And that's about all that I had. If you have any questions, please reach out via YouTube or LinkedIn. I'll be happy to assist the best I can. Good luck on the exam.